Well, welcome to uh, today's webinar. Uh, welcome to people from all over the world. We've got a huge uh, crowd uh, that have uh, registered to be with us and uh, it's great to have you all. Uh, we're gonna be talking about applying to uh, round one in the fall of 2020 amid COVID-19. The, the, the words in the media we talk about, exceptional, unprecedented, um, these truly are un unusual times. And I'm uh, delighted that um, for the next hour, I'm gonna be uh, joined by uh, two of my colleagues from uh, Fortuna Admissions. Uh, with me are Judith Silverman Hadara, who was one of the uh, directors at uh, Fortuna. Uh, Judith was the former uh, director of MBA Admissions at, uh, at Wharton. Judith, thanks for, uh, for joining us with your very colorful background. Sure, I'm glad to be here. Um, thanks so much for having me. And Cassandra Pittman, um, one of our expert coaches. Uh, Cassandra has many uh, of the world's top business schools to her name. She was an associate director at both INSEAD and the London Business School, and also a Columbia MBA. We still wonder, uh, Cassandra, how you managed to get that GMAT quant score, but um, one of life's mysteries. <laughs> <laughs> um, and my name is Matt Simmons. I'm a, a director at Fortuna. I write about business education for Forbes and the BBC. I used to write for The Economist and, and Bloomberg uh, and wrote a book that McKinsey and Goldman and others were kind enough to sponsor that looked at uh, applying to business school. Uh, and of course, uh, that's what this uh, session really is about uh, today. Um, we've done other webinars that I would encourage you to look at that um, consider those looking at round three. That's going to be one of the brief subjects of discussion, um, perhaps an unprecedented opportunity uh, to still secure mm -hmm. your place for some of the world's top business schools and the programs that start in the fall this year. Uh, but our focus really will then be on uh, looking ahead uh, and the fact that all of you are joining the webinar a good five months before round one uh, deadlines uh, will begin. Um, I can only congratulate you on your forward planning <clears throat> to be able to really make the difference in the coming months to the quality of your applications. And with Judith and with Cassandra, we will be looking at each of those uh, different steps. But, um, you know, we talked about exceptional uh, circumstances. What just happened? <laughs> uh, we're in regular contact with, uh, with a lot of the top schools. And of course, by um, mid-January, uh, the likes of Stanford and Wharton that usually like to have filled about 98 or 98 percent of their places for uh, by the end of round two. Uh, London Business School and INSEAD were reporting some great volumes uh, for their September class and then the wheels fell off uh, and suddenly were plunged into uh, a pandemic that uh, is bringing the world to a halt. Um, I imagine that the great majority of you are joining us from home. Um, and yeah, we're looking at schools that are scrambling. We've been talking with M7 schools that wonder how they will fill all of those places in their classrooms uh, for programs that start just a few months from now. Um, we see this as an unprecedented, op pre unprecedented opportunity, mm -hmm. um, not just at the M7, but of course across a great number of business schools. Um, because we all know how selective it is to secure your place at uh, Stanford, INSEAD, Wharton, London Business School, Harvard, and elsewhere. Now, Harvard, of course, no longer has a round three, so they're, they're officially done. We'll be talking about their two plus two program a little bit later on and some of their extended deadlines. But for the rest of them, it is this challenge with uh, applicants and you know, admitted candidates from all over the world um, that have embassies that are closed, people may not be able to get their visas, others that are struggling to take a, a GMAT now that test centers have been closed. So we're gonna be looking at all of those uh, details. Um, on the Fortuna website, uh, you can keep track of deadlines which continue to shift. Uh, Sloan is among them. They've now announced that uh, their round three deadline will move to the middle of June. Chicago Booth, they have a one-time extension. Uh, that takes us to the end of May. So uh, if uh, Chicago was on your um, list, then suddenly you've been given an extra, what, six or seven weeks to pull things mm -hmm. together uh, mm -hmm. to secure a place uh, in September. And equally, as we look at other top schools in the US, whether they've extended, whether they've added deadlines, Garden is now going into the middle of July. Uh, and all of those early admit wow. programs, uh, the two plus two program at Harvard Business School, at Wharton and their advanced placement, um, Kellogg, Yale and their Silver Scholars, uh, they're giving everybody a good six to eight additional weeks to be able to put together those applications. And if you're intending to take a GMAT or a GRE and of course find that all of the test centers have been closed, um, GRE has already moved to home testing 
uh, on the GRE and GMAT has rushed to announce that they will be looking at something very similar from the middle of April. So schools are being very flexible about the waivers, the extensions, or even conditional uh, admits that they will then make. I talked about how selective it is. Typically, uh, Stanford is looking at 18 or 19 uh, applicants for every one place in the program. Uh, and as we start to look at the class of 2022, and all of you that are considering applying in September this year, I would encourage you to uh, go onto the Fortuna website to download the deep dive analysis that we did of the Harvard and the Stanford classes. We wanted to know where people studied, what they studied, the companies mm -hmm. that they worked at, the positions that they held. And of course, it paints an extraordinary picture of the diversity and the talent pool uh, that is applying to, to these schools. We're working on other deep dives for Wharton INSEAD uh, and the rest of the top schools. One of the messages, of course, that emerges from that is how selective Harvard, Stanford and the rest of the M7, the likes of INSEAD and LBS typically are. Mm -hmm. But now we're looking at something quite extraordinary. And as I talked about how they're scrambling to fill classes in September, um, we're hosting an event at the end of this month uh, with, uh, we have the admissions directors from Stanford, from INSEAD, from Wharton, from London Business School and other great schools that will all be talking about bringing in that uh, incoming class for the fall. And then of course, as they start to look ahead. So we hope that you can uh, join us uh, on Zoom at the end of the month with all of those admissions directors, career service directors and deans. Are schools looking for a particular type of candidate? Now, Judith, typically you spent 11 years in admissions at Wharton and round three was what, the Hail Mary, right? No one was really, this wasn't the strategy for anybody to applying to round three at Wharton or any other top school. That is true. And um, I, I really, um, we used to call it the Hail Mary, really. I mean, it was sort of, and I think a lot of schools would, would have said the same thing. It was sort of like, you throw it at a bullseye. If you get it, great. If you don't, it was sort of no harm, no foul, because a lot of these folks would then end up applying the following year. But round three, I think for all schools, was a strange mishmash of people that genuinely were really viable candidates and maybe had had a change in circumstance or they really, something, you know, led them to want to apply fairly late in the game, or they were folks who figured, why not? And um, I think that you could really see the difference between people that were incredibly thoughtful about that application and those that figured they would just give it a shot. Um, that has without a doubt changed um, in this round three, where there's many more applicants that are, that are really pretty viable. And I think schools are pretty excited about that, that um, as Matt mentioned, there are so many reasons that the makeup of the fall class may be changing um, in, in so many different directions. And so having a fairly robust round three is certainly something that's going to be very different for the schools this year. Uh, and I think they're, they're happy about that. I think that they're going to probably find more depth in those pools than they might have in previous years. Right, I mean, we're, we're talking to admits, you know, clients of Fortuna who have their place for September. There, there are those concerns about uh, visas and, and mobility, but even the concern of what, what will they then um, encounter when, when they arrive at business school in September? Uh, the idea that it might still be in an online format. Obviously schools have moved to complete their summer semesters uh, online. So there's a, there's, a, there's a lot of agitation and possibly a lot of places that are opening up in round three. Without a doubt. And I'm sure that, um, you know, Cassandra has seen that as well with her, with her clients and people that are thinking about next steps. And is it worth it for me to pay and to invest resources, time, energy um, in a program that may or may not actually be face-to-face, -face, but, but weighing that against eventually graduating with that degree in an economy that has somewhat recovered from the recession that we're entering. So it's for many people, there's, it's, it's really a, like a weighing on balance. Okay, this is going to be four months, not what I expected, but I'm still going to come out on the other side, you know, with better prospects than I might have otherwise. So it's certainly, I, I'm having so many of these conversations these days. Right. And, and we may see in the coming weeks and, and hence, uh, you know, staying um, in touch for all of the COVID updates that we're providing. Uh, UNC Keenan Flagler announced just yesterday that they would look to push back the class start by at least two or three weeks and the hope that that would bring them, sure. um, you know, more people to uh, to campus and, you know, that, that sort of getting everyone together, the FaceTime that everyone looks forward to, right. already the start of those recruiter events, everything else that takes place uh, on, on campus. So, so wait and see, I, I can see schools, you know, looking to push back 
uh, class starts to as late as, as they feasibly can. Uh, now, Cassandra, of course, with your background, uh, INSEAD and Columbia included in that background, they are two schools a little unusual in that they both offer a, a January, uh, the Columbia J term, and of course, INSEAD has both a September uh, and, a, and a January class start. These two schools, among some of the others, might be among the initial uh, beneficiaries of of a wave of applicants now saying, hey, look at the economy. Uh, it's time for me to head back to, 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 to business school. Um, but they're still trying to do a lot to put together applications to meet those school deadlines. So any special considerations for them? Um, you know, I think that, that it's important to, to look at these two schools um, individually, because actually what you're going to need to do to position yourself for each school is going to be entirely different, right? So for Columbia, the J term specifically doesn't have a summer break, which means that you don't have that opportunity to do an internship. And so if you are, you, know, you were thinking of applying uh, for, you know, the rolling admission normally for September, and you think, you know what, actually, I, I want to potentially start a little bit later and maybe avoid this online learning thing. Um, and I'll just throw my, the application I would have thrown in September, but I'll throw it in January. It's not going to work because Columbia is going to need to know why you think you don't need the, the, uh, the summer internship because that is a really important part of the program. Almost completely flip side to that is the, the NCIJ term has a summer break to do an internship, whereas the summer, summer start doesn't. Um, and so again, they're going to want to see, you know, why do you want to do um, that J term and what are you going to do with that, with that uh, summer break? So, you know, it, it's, it's advice that we would be telling um, candidates all the time, right? Which is make sure that you, uh, that you do your due diligence and, and make sure that you um, bespoke your, make your applications bespoke, but, but more than ever now, because they're going to see through an application that was meant for uh, another time or, or another program. Right, and, and INSEAD has said that they would make some conditional offers, assuming that you will then provide uh, the GMAT score and, and the quant that they certainly want to see in an intensive one-year program. You know, we know that Columbia, as their GMAT scores have risen to 732 in the last uh, year, um, you know, that they're going to be looking for that demonstration as well. So all the components will be there, uh, and these will be uh, very competitive classes. Now, our focus, we said, would be for... Uh, for those looking at business school in the fall of 2021 and therefore applying starting from September this year. We've been here before. Uh, Judith, I mean, we're, we're such stalwarts in business education, you know, and unfortunately we were already involved when um, the internet bubble burst back in 2001 and, you know, schools, I think it was 2002 that Harvard went above 10,000 applications mm -hmm, for mm -hmm. the first time in its history. Um, and then I, you know, I remember even, that and there was a whole discussion about if you worked for a company that was on the bubble and then broke Was that a good essay story to say that you would you know come through a failure saw a lot of failure essays that year so <laughs> <laughs> and, and what are we, seven, seven, seven eight years later and maybe yeah. you were working at Lehman Brothers when when they collapsed and uh, Photos of you taking your boxes, um, but historically there's always been this sort of um, <clears throat> counter cycle where you know we see the downturn in the economy uh, and applications right. in what almost straight away, but in the next 12 to 24 months, uh, just shoot up. So that's something I think that we're all expecting to see in the coming months. Without a doubt. And this is, you know, uh, uh, this, the circumstances of this upcoming economy, the recession, as I mentioned earlier, are not, are different than the other two that Matt and I and Cassandra have, have been through as professionals in admissions in the field, but without a doubt, we, we are seeing personally those numbers. We're hearing from M7 directors. They're getting a lot more inquiries and people really want information. The schools are doing a remarkable job, I think, of trying to get information out there. And, and because that, that high touch, that one-to-one -one is so important for schools. So they're really doing a lot to make sure that applicants understand their programs and are feeling a sense of what the culture's like, what the curriculum would be for them. So they're really pulling out all the stops to try to educate individuals that are applying in the fall. Um, and certainly, I, I guess I want to also say, this doesn't mean that you shouldn't apply. I mean, it is going to be a big application round coming up in round two of next year as well, but schools are also really looking, right? So they are, they are going to be uh, tap dancing pretty fast to figure out what to do this fall, and then very interested for the, for the following year. And, and you make the point, I mean, you could have been working at, um what was it, world.com or one of the other uh, internet starlets that then collapsed? <laughs> I think or, it was or... pets.com or one of them that didn't, um, <clears throat> that was notorious at the time. <clears throat> I mean, this, 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 this feels different. I mean, we're yeah. talking about 
uh, already those admits to, to the, the class that would have started in September, where schools, I think, will look to accompany them. Harvard has already put out a message, Chad wrote to everybody saying, you know, the international applicant pool is such an integral part of our school. Mm -hmm. If there are issues, you know, for obtaining visas, we will move, you know, heaven and earth to, to, right. to uh, bring you into the class. But if they can't, then they will probably offer them places for next year, which means already that there will be a number of uh, individuals uh, and places assigned. We're seeing a lot. I you know, had somebody um, that started Columbia's J term who said, you know, within four yeah. weeks, everything was online. The summer's going to be online. Uh, they're saying that the first half of the fall semester is going to be online. And I didn't pay, you know, the best part of $200,000 to meet everybody on Zoom. So um, there's going to be a lot of challenges on people pulling out of programs to start all over next year. Now, when the stock market crashes, you know, we've seen oil that's collapsed to $23 a barrel. You know, the aviation industry has ground to a halt. Schools understand, I mean, this isn't personal. It's an industry that you're working in and, you know, this is going to have massive uh, repercussions. So if you've been uh, laid off, uh, you no longer have a position, um, the schools aren't going to hold that against you, right? By no means. I don't know, um, Cassandra's shaking her head as well, but I talked to somebody yesterday that works for an entertainment company in California, and she said, the people that have my job are now being laid off slash, you know, furloughed for how long that she doesn't know. She goes, I'm assuming that this is going to happen to me next. And I said, look, this is not a surprise to anybody. And schools recognize it. So you are going to have a gap in your resume. It is going to be really hard to get back, you know, if you're, if you have been made redundant currently. And and, and this is not going to be something that you're going to have to explain in such great detail because it is happening, you know, acro across the board. Um, and schools, I think, are going to understand that it does take resilience, it takes thought, and it takes a lot of determination to kind of, you know, figure out, okay, well, this happened, so now what? And that's, I think, what the schools are going to be looking for. It's the now what piece. I'm sure Cassandra, she's nodding, would agree with me. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's about using this time, um, you know, in a way that you create value, but that is also consistent with who you are and your overall narrative that you're going to be putting forward in your application, right? So if you do something that's completely off the wall, um, yeah, that's nice as long as you, you've contributed, but even better if you can think about, okay, what are the things that I was already involved in, the things that I was already passionate about, the things I already wanted to make an impact in, and how can I use this time to continue doing that? Um, and maybe there's an even more pressing need um, or a way that, that, that you can get involved that, uh, that didn't exist before because of, because of this global crisis. So, so we talked about the flexibility of you know, GMAT and GRE tests mm -hmm. and the uncertainty that surrounds those. In, in typical years, and this is anything but a typical year, um, you know, we, we've seen traditional feeders. We work with any number of consultants, of bankers, of software engineers um, that, that, that really make up a major part of the, the applicant pool. Um, when suddenly you, you see a lot of people coming out of the oil and gas industry, or let's imagine that you know, people are applying from aviation. I mean, right now that the tech firms, uh, some are doing very well because they're providing the sort of digital tools that we're all uh, relying on. Right. Um, but when, as you think about this diversity that you're looking to bring in, how does an admissions office manage when suddenly you've got a spike and all of these people that were working in the energy sector, all of these people, you know, emerge from, from a sector that's been so badly hit by COVID. Uh, does that change perspectives in looking for the diversity in an MBA class? Um, Judith, you want me to take this one? <laughs> yeah, why don't you start and then I'll, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm thinking it through. <laughs> you know, um, I think you mentioned uh, one exception, um, you know, potentially, you know, tech is, is potentially doing well and, you know, healthcare, uh, depending on where you are, might also mm -hmm. be doing well now. Otherwise, I mean, I think this crisis is a, is, is a pretty big equalizer. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it's not that recession has hit some of the world and not others. Uh, you know, it's, it's an economic contraction everywhere. Uh, uh, virtually every industry is hit. And so I don't think it's so much about the, the diversity of the class because you're going to be seeing lots of applications from lots of uh, different uh, career profiles. Um, and that's not going to be a problem. I think the challenge for, um, for applicants in this pool as ever is how do you stand apart? Right. So now the pool is going to be even larger, um, you know, from people of all different backgrounds, you know, potentially all different nationalities, definitely all career paths. Um, it's even more important now 
that you think about not just what you have done that is exceptional, because lots of people have done exceptional things, but also what is it that makes you different and unique mm -hmm. and a real value add to the class. Um, and that's, that's where the work is for the applicant now, um, as it always is, but now more than ever. Judith, we gave you that extra minute to think about your response to this. Yeah, and, you know, thank you've, you. You've seen these crises before. I would agree that it is easy to psych yourself out and think, oh my gosh, there are so many consultants applying. There's so many bankers applying. There's so many people yeah. in tech applying and the aviation industry is going to be swamped and you know, hospitality and everywhere. But I do maintain that you are more than just what you do for a living. I really yes. believe that. And mm -hmm. so when I talk with folks on the phone about their interest in applying to business school and they say, oh, well, I'm in a pool that's really deep and I do blah, blah, blah. I'm like, so let's skip over what you actually do and let's talk about like who you are and, and what are the things that are interesting to you and why do you want to go to business school? I really, and I did this a lot when I was in admissions that at, at Wharton was, was, we were so curious about what you were and who you were as an individual. The fact that you did X in X industry was so much less relevant to us. Um, I mean, certainly it had informed how you made decisions and how you problem solve and how you were creative and worked on teams, but it was really just the vehicle by which you learned how to do all these things. So to me, that is really, and Cassandra was talking about, you know, the, the, the narrative and the storytelling, and that is really, I'm like holding it in my hand. Like that's the nugget that all these schools are looking for. What is it about you, not what industry do you come from? Um, and so, I, again, I, I know it is so, I, I, I know this because I, we talk to people all the time that are, oh, there are too many people that are applying for my industry. And I, just, I think, well, look, you know, everybody's got something different to talk about. And you want to make sure that you're talking about things that really are important to you, that are very genuine, and that's going to come across. So um, if, I, if I could give a message, it would be, don't psych yourself out before you kind of get involved in the, in the process and that there's a lot more there than you might realize at the outset. Um, and that's, that's something that's really important to kind of tuck in your pocket and, and bring with you. I mean, we, we always talk about um, the importance that Har Harvard assumes that we all know that they invented the case method 99 years ago. Wharton would love <laughs> us to know that, you know, there's so much more than finance with real estate, healthcare, uh, retail 3.0, Warby Parker style. I mean, you know, the school has more electives than, than any other school on the planet. You know, the, the schools themselves are, are, are so much more. Um, they're going to have to change how they communicate because you know, right now they're relying on uh, virtual events and webinars. They've already, through round two, had to move everything to, uh, uh, to Zoom and Skype uh, interviews. Uh, do, do you see them uh, sort of adapting their message in the next six months? Because they, they, you know, for the immediate future, they won't be able to get on the road. And also advice that both of you would have for how, as applicants, you can really make that worthwhile connection, whether it's with an alum. You know, we're all at home right now, so, you know, the, the alum included, um, and what we can do uh, to sort of leverage this time uh, to connect with schools and their communities. Hmm. I think it's a really, really good question, Matt. And I also think this event is going to make schools and companies think a lot differently about how they operate well after it has passed. So uh, I had a conversation um, with somebody who leads global MBA recruiting for a, um, a large global pharmaceutical company it's based here in the UK. And you know, she was saying, listen, you know, we're going to do everything online. Uh, we're already planning to do everything online. We have to make plans uh, this year. And I, and I imagine what will happen is that we will then continue to do everything online because we will see that we can get exceptional results and make good connections and, and not spend the money and the time you know, traveling to many different schools. And actually she was saying probably get a larger pool of candidates as well right, and, right. You know, and be in touch with a lot more and it can have lots of um, knock on benefits for diversity and you know, different mm -hmm. things that they, they wanna do, social mobility, et cetera. Um, and, I, and I suspect the same thing is gonna to happen to education. They're gonna be thinking, I mean, education needed to disrupt, it's being disrupted. And a lot of the, the oldest, best schools maybe might be a little bit slow to adopt some of that disruption for their flagship programs. But I think now they, you know, they have to, and that's gonna extend as well to, to the admissions process. Mm -hmm. So um, I think it's absolutely right that people think about um, how do they make those connections because we still need to make human connections and it's it's hard to do that over over a webinar like this for example when the three of us are talking but we're not having one-on-ones with other people um, but I think it's gonna it's gonna make people get very very 
clever about their um, their online brand and their and their digital networking. And those are like you know buzzwords that kind of make you feel a little bit sick to your stomach. But um, but it's true. You need to get over. You need to be able to send emails out to people uh, on LinkedIn or in other social networks and say, hey, you know, you have 15 minutes for a Zoom. Uh, I'd love to. I'd love to just pick your brain. I'd love to hear about your experience. Uh, love to get your advice. You're not asking for anything particular, but but really trying to make those connections. Um, and that that means putting yourself out there, and it means you know potentially hearing no, or sometimes even worse than no, not getting a reply at all, and having to overcome that. And I know that schools are really mobilizing their <coughs> excuse me their current students to reach out, to be engaged, to be available. Um, so if you you know you're thinking about oh you know, should I apply or should I go, you know, for those of you that have been admitted for this year, there's so many people on the other side that really are going to respond to you. Um, mm. You know, it's, it's so clear to us that, um, that especially second years are like, yeah, we want to help, you know, they, they feel very passionate about their programs. They want to share their experiences with you. Um, and so it is certainly an evolving piece, right? The technology three weeks ago for all of us that were doing these sessions is super different than it is today. It's, mm -hmm. it's much more fluid. There's a little bit of a higher bar. I mean, I felt like it was a little rudimentary a couple of weeks ago when, when I just started talking to people on Zoom and you know, we've gotten better and now everybody has these fancy backgrounds and I'm, I'm laughing, but it's really, you know, this, this is now gonna be the way that things are done. And the access to entry is so much more easy because you don't have to go visit. You don't have to fly out to a school. You don't have to attend class in person. And for some people, they couldn't, you know, resources, time, all of these things might keep them from going. So, you know, in, in previous years. So I think this is a, a really, as, as Cassandra said, you know, disruptive um, to education in a wonderful way that, that you're going to, you're going to see lots of people that maybe wouldn't have been in these pools that are, that are now highly considering it. I wonder with such a, a high impact um, and, and uh, 2020 what it has meant the world over uh, as, as you said Cassandra you know this is this is for everybody mm -hmm. um, we've already seen the likes of Kellogg uh, Yale INSEAD LBS that have all introduced uh, a video essay or, or, or some uh, some sort of format around that uh, there's been much more uh, Skype video interviewing even you know Wharton with their team-based discussion how they had to restructure that and I wonder if they will bring any components of this into essays that they ask that they typically publish at the end of May. Will we have a, a COVID question that sort of works its way into the right. essay? What we'd love to talk about, and this will be a, a little bit later, because um, we're also taking all of your questions and we're going to leave 10 minutes at the end for Q&A. Um, we wanted to talk about COVID attitude and you know how you as an individual, um, you know, not just sitting on your couch watching uh, reruns on Netflix, but you know how you're continuing to engage whether professionally or in your community as a great way to demonstrate the sort of patterns of behavior that schools love to see. Um, maybe a special nod for the uh, international uh, audience because mm -hmm. already as we look at um, US schools and the concerns they have about uh, you know visas uh, to be able to go and study, I think Canadians have it easier because you know F1 visas um, are far more straightforward. Um, do you see, I mean, do you feel that this will bring the world closer or will it put up barriers and that international applicants will have a harder time uh, applying next year for the US schools fearing that, you know, we don't want to go through all of this again and, you know, have a part of the applicant pool that just can't get to us? I cannot imagine a world uh, in which the schools themselves uh, are the ones that, that mm -hmm choose to select fewer international applicants. Um, it would be, you know, completely contrary to the values and, and the intention that, that every school that I know has. But what we, what we don't know is what travel restrictions are going to look like in the next five months. Um, mm -hmm. You know, five months is not that far away. And if we're dependent on a vaccine to get out of this, you know, the, the honest truth is we do not know. And I think we need to, to level with people about that. We don't know if the travel restrictions are going to be lifted. We don't know if the State Department's going to be back up and running and, and processing visas. And that's the big question mark. Um, a lot of schools don't usually offer deferments. Um, but in, in this situation, they might well offer uh, deferments. I would imagine if it's a, it's a visa situation. Um, that might may or may not uh, help somebody who wants to go to business school now. And so I think it's really important to do that, that thinking up front to you know, know where you're, if, if you're, if you're uh, 
top school and your top choice is, is in the US, your top two or three choices are in the US, but you, you have a backup option that's um, closer to home, um, it, it's to really do that calculus for yourself and weigh up, you know, would I, would I take my backup option that's closer to home um, or would I wait uh, until, until this moment has passed? And of course, a bit like visiting the dentist, anyone that's been putting off uh, taking their GMAT or GRE <laughs> they may feel that um, uh, there's been a blessing from somewhere. Um, now, but both tests are talking about moving uh, online. The last time that GMAT uh, you know, had a shift like this, it went from a paper-based test with our number two pencils, and then it was the whole computer adaptive thing. Um, and I can remember GMAT sort of talking about you know, scores that were valid for five years, they introduced mm -hmm. integrated reading. They love to be able to benchmark a set of test scores with previous experience. But I don't know, t testing from home, which, you know, for some people will add a, an additional dimension of that webcam and just either performing very well or, or you know, uh, struggling uh, on the test. Do you think, either of you think that um, an online GMAT taken from home is gonna carry less weight? Than, than the previous test center tests? I can't imagine. I mean, unless you want to discount for stress, but it's got a different kind of stress, right? So I, I, you know, I know that some people do much better on the practice exams at, the, at their own desk right. than they do in a testing center, which is, so it'll, it's, I, I think actually it's a great science, scientific experiment. It's not gonna, the schools are not gonna discount for it. I just, I think that, that from a comfort level, you know, you, you can kind of be in your own place and, and get in your own groove and you don't have to like sign in at the test center and your heart's pounding and you're like, oh my gosh, this is it. You know, it definitely seems a little more relaxed as does everything. I think that there's a lot of creativity going on these days because people are not under the stress of being in a conference room all the time. I mean, on Zoom, it's very different, right? So I feel like it, it, I schools, I, in my understanding and my conversations are not gonna discount at all. Um, it's not gonna weigh less. But I personally am really interested to see, are the scores gonna ha kind of have a different outcome? Is there gonna be an overall sense of like, oh, that wasn't nearly as bad as I thought it was gonna be. Um, and we know that GMAT is going online in a couple of weeks. Um, and we're really hoping that people will get back to us and let us know what their experience was like. Yeah, yeah. But maybe Matt, you can sign up and take it online and let us know. <laughs> At the guinea pig. Um, no, I think Cassandra, you enjoyed the whole GMAT experience, right? I mean, we'll, we'll talk about it. Because it, it it's a data point that schools have, you know, relied on for decades. Um, I think we might get sued by GMAC if I shared my real reviews. Uh, <laughs> I, I suppose, that, you know, the, the schools, as we push them for clarity, I hope that um, the event that we're hosting with the admissions directors of NCAD, LBS, Stanford, Wharton, you know, both NCAD and LBS have talked about um, they're not waiving the test per se, but they will make, you know, sort of conditional offers, assuming that right. you'll subsequently be able to, uh, to, to take the GMAT. So, uh, you know, we'll, we'll be staying in touch with those schools uh, to then be able to share how those policies may alter, you know, if, if on online is the only option for, for, the, for the coming uh, months. So I do want to make just a quick point on, on the GMAT GRE, um, you know, um, exceptions to, you know, so a lot of people I think now that, that have, um, been apprehensive about taking the test, maybe not been scoring what they wanted to on the practice test and see this window now to apply to schools without their scores and mm -hmm. think, okay, great, I can get my application without the score and that's gonna help because I didn't, you know, but I think, you know, schools get applications from all over the world and it's really difficult to um, equalize different educational systems and different, you know, marking systems, et cetera. And the GMAT or GRE, as imperfect as it is, and I think we can all agree it's very imperfect, it does give the schools a way to measure your academic capacity to the same, uh, you know, in the same way they're measuring everybody else's. And if, particularly if you have good, but maybe not, you know, super exceptional undergrad or, you know, previous academic work, the GMAT or the GRE is a, is a way to show that you have you know, great academic capacity. And so without that, it's not necessarily a benefit to apply. Um, and so, you know, we do have the GRE that's available to take now. Uh, the, as you mentioned, the GMAT, we, we believe will be coming on soon. And, and what I would say is, you know, try to apply with a score if you can, or, or very quickly afterwards, um, so that they have that data point, because it's not always going to do you good not to have it. 
One of the questions that came in, do, do, do you think that the GMAP will have more or less weight given current circumstances? You know, do extracurriculars, maybe volunteer work that you're doing, could, could they stand out more as, as GMAP and GRE perhaps are, you know, um, uh, taking more of a back seat? I still think that schools are going to want to see that quantitative and, and analytical verbal ability. I mean, we know that they're not going to look, they've worked so hard to get their numbers where they are. I can't imagine that all of a sudden they're going to say, oh yeah, sure, 600 is fine. Um, I think that they are going to uphold. They're going to recognize, of course, that there may be some, um, some anomalies, but I, I can't imagine that all of a sudden they're not going to help uphold the standards of, of scores that, that they've been you know, working on for the past number of decades. Um, and, it'll, and it'll be interesting to see what happens. But in my, from what I'm hearing, schools are not sort of saying, okay, we're going to go, we're, we're okay with really low. You know, they still want you to be in that range. Okay. So I'm going to give you both of you a heads up. We are getting some fantastic, I mean, there are hundreds of people on, on this webinar. We're getting some amazing questions. So I suggest that at the end, a little bit like a game show, it's going to be <laughs> quick fire questions about you know, applying in round three. Do I need to explain it and explain my choice of recommenders? So uh, be be, be, be prepared. Um, and, All right, uh, I'm ready. My uh, hands on the buzzer, Cassandra, get yours. We, in the last three years, we've seen uh, application volume to the top US schools decline. Part of that was um, uh, you know, a, a, um, a very strong job market, among other things. You know, it was around 3%, so people uh, weren't prepared to uh, give that up for, for business school. Um, there was the impact on international students, uncertainty that the administration caused around H-1B visas, you know, a variety of reasons. Sure. So I want a number from both of you. Um, well, round one, and in fact, the entire admission cycle of 20, 20, 20 21, from your experience, um, how much more? I think we're saying it will be more competitive. How much more competitive? Could, can you see numbers jumping by 20, 30 percent? Sorry. Judith, are you hitting that buzzer? Yeah, sorry. Um, I might hit the right. That, it was, that, was, uh, that was a buzzer from downstairs about long division. <laughs> um, I believe that those numbers are going to be where we were, you know, in 2008. I do. <laughs> So I think that, they, you know, Matt, you mentioned 10,000. I think it's not out of the realm of possibility. Um, so that's, that's, my, that's my, my answer for this morning. Right. You're going for that. So that, that would be based on uh, current numbers anywhere between sort of a 15, 20% jump for, for Harvard. That would be another 8, 9% jumping back into the pool. I mean, Cassandra, within that, and if you have a number, I'd love to hear it. But also, do you think that uh, one of the consequences, will people apply to more schools or fewer schools? My, my hypothesis would be more schools. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, because people need more options because there's, there's less certainty. So mm -hmm. yes, I think, and this is why when we look at, you know, oh, application volume is so much, you know, it's, I mean, okay, Harvard, Stanford, there are some exceptions, right? But, um, but oftentimes that is, you also, you have to look at there's more applicants and that's the number that, that is actually important. But then I think sometimes we get caught up in, the number of applications a school has had. Well, that, right, that right. same applicant is probably applying to more places. Sure. And so it is more competitive. It is important that you that you really do the work in crafting a strong narrative, understand what makes you different, et cetera, understand what's compelling about your story. Um, but it's probably not as bad as you imagine. Right. Okay, well, that's, that's, there's a positive note in there. And I would uh, echo, course. I kind of hope that people do apply to, to a wider group of schools. I mean, why not? You know, there's the opportunity is there. We know that schools are looking. So, you know, the M7 and, and then, the, um, you know, the schools that are, um, you know, right behind that, I, I, I really feel like have, they're so eager, right, across the board. So if initially you would sort of said, all right, I'm only going to throw my hat into three, you might decide to stagger that and do a couple in round one and a couple in round two and maybe, you know, even beyond that. So I, right. I'm echoing Cassandra, certainly. Right. So, so yeah, I mean, the current students or those that are graduating right now, of course, are um, approaching their schools sometimes in very big numbers saying, hey, this isn't what we signed up for. Uh, we want tuition refunds. I actually don't want us to, to try to answer that question unless you have something compelling to say. I suppose my thought would be, as schools struggle through this period um, and you know the, the hit that, that, that they might take, how do you think that might play out for scholarships next year? Do you think that there will be 
more scholarships available? Will they have somehow looked to um, you know work with the, the graduating students and efforts to you know support them in, and, and that there will be less money available? Which which, which way might that go? Uh, Cassandra? Yeah, do, do you want to take it from a, I, I, yeah. my guess is, is if anything, there's not going to be loads more scholarships available because if, if the market continues, continues to, I mean, it really depends on what the market's doing, but a lot of these schools depend on their endowments, you know, they're going to have taken a hit, uh, with, with the market, just like everything else. Um, we can see charity sectors, you know, around, around the world are, are really suffering now. People have less disposable income. They're not. They're not inclined to to donate now. And you know, schools don't have a magic pot of money that the rest of the world doesn't have, um, or they don't beyond the, beyond their endowments. And so um, that that would be my guess. I don't know, Judith. You. you so I'm thinking that it is possible that schools would put off awarding tuition scholarships until a year from now, right? So even if you're admitted for January in or in December. I'm betting, like if you look at the, you would give another six, five or six months for that endowment to slightly, you know, it to slightly creep up again. Um, again, I don't, I, I don't, are your guess is as good as mine on this one, I think, because it, this is, this is pretty unprecedented, this amount um, that the schools across the board, you know, not just the graduate programs, it's all of their undergraduate funding, it's all of their research funding. I mean, it's, if you think about an institution, there are so many different places that that, that, that money is, is now going to be, uh, reduced or missing entirely. Yeah. Right. And, and uh, the other thing I, I think is uh, just just what we touched on this before, but you know, I mentioned that that education was was already as an industry being disrupted, uh, and now I think a lot of the the uh, you know big schools and, and their flagship programs are going to need to follow suit with that. Um, so I I would encourage people to to think about um, whether or not it's true that you need to be in a classroom you know, a physical classroom to learn this stuff. And I would encourage them to actually just be asking um, the, the schools, look, what are you doing in this environment to make sure that we have opportunities to network effectively with our classmates um, and with, you know, key business leaders? Because it's, you know, it, so you're not gonna be in a physical classroom, what else is there? And it's, it's on the onus of the schools to think about how they continue to deliver that value um, in this situation. And it's totally, it's completely right that you ask the question, um, but I would say don't assume that you can't get that value um, in, in this current environment. So, so the funding question, so, uh, now I put to you, um, should I apply now? Uh, round three, there are some places that have opened up. We know that the M7 are looking. <laughs> we never get to say that. Very or do I wait and you know, be part of this pool when certain people have deferred to places that have already been uh, set aside? Um, we'll keep the answers fairly brief, I guess, because you know, we've been looking around this question. But... Uh, what, what is your considered advice? This keeps me up in the middle of the night. No joke. <laughs> um, you should apply in round three if you feel like you're not doing it on one foot and it's not a rush job. And I don't mean that, oh, you have until June, but it's like, you, this is a really heartfelt and thoughtful process by which you're being asked to really reflect on your life, your goals, your mission, why you want to do this. So I, if you feel like you can really do that intense work in the next two months for some schools or three months, then it is certainly within the realm of possibility. But I talk to people a lot, as we all do, that now may not be your time. It may be that you need some more of a, of a ramp. You got to get your recommenders on board. You may find some opportunities during this virus to really beef up your leadership and your engagement in the community. So perhaps another couple of months won't feel so rushed. I know there's this, oh my gosh, I need to do something. I need to do it yesterday. But maybe your something is preparing yourself to apply in September. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm saying this really carefully and thoughtfully because I, I, I am having so many of these conversations. And of course we wanna help people you know, do, do what they feel is right for them at a given time. But mm -hmm. I, I really ask you to not just think about a calendar in terms of months until deadline, but your internal ability to really put together a stellar presentation. Mm -hmm. Right, so thank you for that uh, considered response. Um, we're looking at five months between now and uh, typical round one 
uh, deadlines. Let's assume that Harvard Business School again leads the dance and has a deadline somewhere around September the 6th, 7th or 8th. So both of you, um, Cassandra, how can we use these next five months um, productivity, changing uh, life, work, styles. Here we are all uh, locked down at home. Um, mm -hmm. What should we be doing to put together really strong applications for the fall? I think we, we touched upon this question before, but I, I, I want to caveat it by saying, you know, I at least, you know, when we were first going under lockdown here, I had a couple of weeks of, of just absolute panic and stress. Okay, so I want to just come at this from a human perspective as well and say, it's okay if you're not doing everything we're going to recommend that you do right now and for the next five months, because, you know, this is a very stressful situation. A lot of us are, um, are going to see, you know, either ourselves or loved ones fall very sick and we're going to, you know, it's the whole thing is very stressful. So I just want to put that out there on a, on a human level. And we're going to give you um, some advice here, but also um, be kind to yourself through this mm -hmm. process. Mm -hmm. um, but what I would say is, uh, as I said before, think about the impact you have always wanted to make. Think about the things that you were always passionate about. And then think about how those things are affected in the current climate. Um, so you know, one of the things that I'm very, very uh, passionate about is promoting uh, women in leadership roles and women at work, and everybody knows that. And so I'm now thinking about, okay, you know, how is this COVID crisis impacting uh, women in leadership or women on leadership track? Um, disproportionately or in a way that might not have been affected before and is there a way that I can create value uh, with that thing that I have already cared about. So that's kind of the work that I would that I would suggest that people do and then find ways to, to reach out in their in their communities, in their families, in organizations, uh, you know, outside of ideally outside of just their professional sphere. But I know a lot of um, a lot of applicants we work with work with wonderful companies, particularly large companies that are doing a lot of philanthropic work and, you know, doing lots of things that create impact. And that is wonderful, but we need you to do some things outside of that umbrella as well um, to really make the, the impact you want to make in your application. Judith, I don't know if you have something to add. Without a doubt. I mean, this is now the time. There are no barriers to this stuff. So call local organizations that need your help for whatever it is, it may be delivering groceries, it might be reading the little kids online, it might be teaching a, a senior how to use Zoom, over Zoom. You know, there's so much opportunity and it doesn't have to follow the leadership hierarchy that you may be used to. You don't have to be on the board for two years before you can, you know, create a project. Like this is, I, I'm kind of excited about this because I feel like there's lots of ways to, to really get involved that may not have occurred to you. You may have been working 80 hour weeks. You're probably still working 80 hour weeks, but you're not commuting, right? Mm -hmm. So there are all these different things that you can do. And I'm not saying you have to go volunteer at a hospital, but there are certainly communal neighborhood, na you know, national organizations that could really use your thought processes and your ideas and, and your engagement. Um, so that to me is gonna be a huge question that's gonna be asked over the next couple of months. And it, 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 is, it is one that I think there's, there's a lot of movement around and, and that you, could, without thinking too hard about it, could come up for, for, for something that you could really do to impact um, your application. I will also add, for those of you that don't have a quantitative background, now is a great time to study and take an online statistics, finance, or accounting class. All the schools are hoping that you'll have some quant in your background. Um, there are a, a whole lot that are offered online. Um, we're happy to recommend others to you, but not a bad time to kind of get the wheels greased to eventually be in that classroom as well. So something else to think about um, when you're, you know, kind of looking for uh, an additional way to round out your application in the coming months. With, with, with every dean, with every admissions director I've ever met and hosted on panels, you know, they talk about uh, the MBA and uh, this VUCA world of volatility and uncertainty. And of course, how uh, the MBA is, is then a, a year or two year experience to help you to prepare. We all know that Darwin said it's not the strongest or the biggest. It's those that can adapt. So, mm -hmm. you know, we, we talk about this COVID attitude. Uh, speaking to a BCG associate yesterday, he said, I've, I've you know, I've never felt uh, more empowered. I've been able to help the office to transfer and use Slack and other digital tools. So he's showing adaptability. He's being digitally agile, and you know, a whole new skill sets that that sure. he's bringing to uh, to his resume. So is there a, a sort of a COVID attitude? Do you think that the admissions offices, as they look at round one, round two applicants next year, 
will be looking to see, well, how, how did you adapt to such unprecedented circumstances? And, you know, the opportunities for you to show patterns of behavior, whether it was taking a leadership role, taking an initiative, um, that that's really something that, that you can demonstrate in the coming months. Yeah, you know, there's, there's a quote I like, um, and I, I cannot remember for the life of me where I, I'm, I've just been stealing this quote for years and years. It stuck with me, but I can't remember where I read it. Um, and it says, in life, we are defined not by what we achieve, but by what we overcome. And I think I, I, I tell that to my clients a lot with Fortuna, because again, I think a lot of people naturally, they want to lead with all their great things, their accomplishments. Um, but actually the things that have really made you who you are, are these pain points, these challenges that you are, you've overcome. So that's, that's how I would, I would um, encourage people to think about this COVID attitude, because for some people it might be, uh, you know, oh, I work for BCG and I'm finally that, you know, I'm finally allowed to run with a project on my own without getting like 5 million, you know, partner sponsors on it, and et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> and they, they need me to teach them how to, how to work Slack. And for other people, it might be much more personal. You know, this might be touching them in a very, very personal way, you know, potentially somebody in their family or multiple people in their family or, um, you know, in various, very hard hit communities. Um, and so I would, I would say in, in what ways is this crisis, um, mandating necessitating that you rise to the challenge um and and how are you changing from having risen to that challenge i, I can remember the first time i tried to retire you bought me a book cassandra and, and that beautiful uh, opening of all of these creatures clinging to the side of the riverbank mm -hmm. and one of them lets go and they said you know what are you doing letting go he said i'm going to see where this current takes me right yeah. so um well we'll see if we can we'll get someone to do a google search to find your other quotes and be able to source it <laughs> Um, okay, wait, we have 315 people on the line. They can all do a Google search for that quote. <laughs> you, you, <you've laughs> that is your homework. For online statistics or accounting courses, Judith, and anything else. Sorry. That, uh, I apologize for that. Not my first choice, know. but um, <laughs> I do think that if you haven't thought about what you want to do and why you want to do it, take some time. Go for a walk around the block. Stay six feet away from people. But like, you don't come to these decisions overnight, right? So it is hard when you're living your normal life outside of your house or your apartment to really spend some time considering these things. And that, that I, I think that you at least can carve a little room um, to, to really think about, well, is this where I wanna be? And what do I wanna do with this? And maybe, you know, business school is not the right next decision, but you wanna come to it with a full heart, with, with, the th with, with thought. Um, and, and I really look at this time almost as a gift. I know I'm a bit of an optimist. I am reminded of that frequently but that it, it can be an opportunity for you to really spend some time with yourself and then emerge from as on the other side and, and, and with, with some of this, you know, background and resiliency. Um, right. And we're always, as I said, you know, I offer this all the time. We're really happy to talk to you about this, to talk yeah. it through with you. So there's a whole bunch of us that are eager to have these conversations and, and very glad to do so. Yeah, that's what I was going to add to that, Judith. Is um, so, sorry, sorry, Matt. Getting to the stage where it just ends up being me and Judith just chatting to each other. Sorry, um, <laughs> works for me. <laughs> but that's what I was going to add. You know, I think after all these years of, of you know working with people, um, there's there's a there's a certain point where you know you need to think about it and take the time to reflect. But actually, there's also a point where you need to get out of your own head and and talk it through with somebody mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. help somebody. Uh, advance these ideas with you uh, about yourself and help you reflect upon things that are just really hard to get that that perspective on just by yourself. And so whether that's with us at Fortuna or if you have, you know, a, a tro close trusted confidant who's, who's gone through this process before, um, I just want to, you know, really encourage people to do that, to do that work. Right. And presumably if we've just saved that 45 minute commute into downtown Chicago or the traffic of Sao Paulo or Mumbai, uh, then with a little bit of extra study time <laughs> to, to throw into data sufficiency and critical reasoning. I mean, th th these two, you know, we need to take care of. You both said um, those remain important data points in, you know, what, what is a much uh, bigger holistic uh, assessment. Uh, and then perhaps, you know, also that outreach to the schools and some of the ideas. Now, um, I promised that, um, that we'd have a quick fire round and um, there are actually probably even for, for the talented individuals that you are, I think we might have more questions oh. than we have time for. But we will then answer um, each of these and, and share them um, with people. This uh, recording, of course, will then be available afterwards. 
Um, let's see. So this just goes back to early action, the likes of Duke and Dartmouth. Um, how competitive will it be for uh, Columbia also has uh, early action. I guess what we're saying is that for the fall, um, any advantage, I mean, perhaps the question now also becomes, is early action a smart move? If application volumes might be increasing, people applying to more schools, Duke, Tuck, Columbia, they like to feel special, right? And mm -hmm. see an early, mm -hmm. an early application. Cassandra, you're the CBS woman. Yes, uh, early decision is always better. Yeah. Um, and, and this year is going to be no different. But, but you know, there is some ethical guidance here, right? So, you know, when you apply early decision, you are making a, you're telling the school if you are accepted, you will commit. Um, and you have to put down a deposit quite quickly. Um, so also look at your own cash flow, uh, make sure that that will work because most schools will not work with you very much on that initial deposit for early action. Um, you know, they know the game that is played and they're going to need you to put that money down. So, um, but yes, I mean, if you can, you've got five months now or, or slightly, a little bit slightly less, a little bit slightly more for, for those early decision rounds. So, um, so if you do have, um, you know, a school that is your first choice, um, or even a couple, they'll be able to hate me for saying that. Um, the, and you can get, get an application ready and, and put your, really your best foot forward in those early decision rounds, then you should do so. So Judith, this next question uh, is from you. It's from Tim, who um, we talked about the likely increase in applications. You've both also spoken about the chances that people might apply to, to more schools, which mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, as, as we look across the sector, um, that, that growing application volume. From what you saw at Wharton for the 11 years that you were in the admissions office, um, will the acceptance rate drop? I mean, Wharton is one of the most uh, selective schools, or, or do they then feel, well, you know, people will be applying to more schools, we, we actually make more offers and they'll take a hit on yield. Mm -hmm. How might that work? I don't think that the admit rate is going to drop. <clears throat> I think what the schools are doing and not just Wharton is there's going to be a very nice wait list as things kind of pan out that students perhaps that would have been let go at round one may be hanging on until round two. Um, I actually have been in touch with someone who's been waitlisted twice, um, which is really uncomfortable, but I think that's happening a little bit more because schools are kind of hedging their bets longer than they might have ordinarily. So I don't feel like the admit rates are going to drop because this is unprecedented, right? This, um, this kind of scenario, it's not just the economy. It's just that this, it, so last time there was a drop in a recession, for example, the schools were still in person. So now it's, there's a drop in the economy and the schools are not in person. So it's like you're, there's, there's another factor involved. So I don't think that's, I think that schools are gonna play it fairly conservatively, keep wait lists as much as they can. They don't wanna all of a sudden tank their yields. I mean, they, again, the same with the GMAT numbers, they've worked too hard to get to where they are in that level of selectivity. But um, it, it'll be interesting to sort of see, but that's, that's my understanding of, of what's gonna play out in round one and then possibly through round two as well. Great. Cassandra, with your wonderful networking skills that I've always admired, um, sometimes um, it's tough to actually make a connection with current or former students. Any advice, recommendations on how to best approach that outreach, you know, to, to, to uh, engage a response? Yes. Um, my best advice is uh, probably threefold. One is just to do it. Uh, you know, <laughs> so nobody likes it. Even people who are extroverted and have some talent in networking. No one likes thing. It's talking. hard. Picking up the phone is hard, Cassandra. Picking up the phone is hard. <laughs> Sending these cold emails, it feels really like sales. It's like, you know, most people just don't like it, but you just have to do it. That's my number one piece of advice. My number two piece of advice is, um, is be respectful in what you ask for. Um, so, you know, you don't want to, you know, connect with an alum and ask them to write you a recommendation after that first 15 minute chat. And that sounds, you know, honestly, I know people go, oh, and nobody would ever do that, but actually people do that. Yep. Um, and yep. what you want to do is just be, you know, humble and respectful, but also um, confident enough to reach out and say, you know, I was very impressed by X, Y, and Z that I've seen your profile. I'm really interested in learning more about Wharton. I'm really interested in learning more about NCAD. Um, loved your profile. Is there any chance that you've got 15 minutes for me? I would just really benefit from your insight and experience. And most people approach that way if they have the time, and not everybody does. I mean, you're a 
you're a new father again, Matt. So, you know, not everybody has the time and that's what you have to remember. But if they have the time, most people will say yes to that. Um, and if they haven't said yes to that, or if they haven't responded, I think you know, the other thing to, to uh, keep in mind, or my, my other big piece of advice is don't assume malice. Don't assume right. that they, they are ignoring you because they hate your profile or, you know, they don't care anything <laughs> about you. Just assume that they're really busy with life, mm -hmm. you know, and, and they didn't mean anything by it and go on to the next person. That's, that's, or, or ask them again, you know, I mean, uh, in a respectful way. So that's, that's my piece of advice. Great. Uh, Judith, someone that was intending to apply in round one, but is going to jump on this opportunity to apply in an extended round three mm -hmm. deadline. Do they need to explain mm -hmm. that in an optional essay? Um, only if there's a reason that they feel they should explain anything. You know, you don't really want to say, oh, I'm applying because you rolled back your deadlines three weeks or four weeks or two months, right? So if that's a really interesting question and I would love to talk to whoever has asked that in more depth, but you should feel, as I said earlier, that this is a really good presentation. So there should not be any excuses, um, really. You know, I, I think that if you're unsure, you might want to wait till round one but I would not add an optional essay because it doesn't, to me, it doesn't, it, it doesn't change anything about your candidacy. I think that schools are recognizing that there's a lot of that going on. And I don't personally think that you need to explain your decision. Some of the questions that I'm seeing, uh, and of course, over the last nine, 10 years with, with over 40 uh, admissions directors, associate deans, associate directors uh, in Fortune of this dream team uh, from the admissions office, you know, we've covered so many things. We're getting questions about if I'm over 30, uh, the differences between round one and round two, um, deadlines that are being extended that obviously we're tracking with our uh, live feed on, on COVID. Um, so I suggest that we will try to send links to some of those articles. You've both, um, you know, spoken about those or, you know, how to best interview if uh, an interview is going to be done uh, on via Skype. Cassandra, you wrote on Forbes on that subject. So um, I'm sure that with some of that great material and of course on the Fortuna website, there's just a, a wealth of resources that, that Judith and Cassandra, Caroline, all of our colleagues have put together from their uh, experience at these uh, top schools. So uh, thank you for sharing um, so many questions that, that the audience that clearly coming in from all over the world. Um, we understand the uncertainty. Both of you, I think, have spoken very eloquently and very clearly about um, you know, the, the very personal decision that is involved in applying to business school mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, wanting to reach out to just to be able to talk through some of those options. So please, um, with the team, there are email addresses if there was uh, something that we touched upon and you wanted to follow up. Um, and please do reach out for one of those um, free uh, strategy sessions together to, to, to look at your situation because you know, every story is personal. And then don't forget at the end of this month, we will be hosting admissions director and careers director panels uh, with the senior staff at, at the likes of the GSB at INSEAD, Wharton, LBS. There, there's a whole bunch of fantastic schools that will be with us. So we hope that will, and, and I'm going to take some of these questions and ask them to, <laughs> to come to at Stanford and, and Blair at Wharton. Um, you came up with some great questions. Um, Judith and Cassandra, I think you, you handled those questions wonderfully. Thank you for so much insight in the last hour. Um, and I guess we'll probably do this again very soon, right? We look forward to it. And, yeah. uh, and just, again, just we really wishing everybody stay safe and, uh, you know, I'm really, really wishing everybody well. And, and please don't be afraid to reach out to us. You see our emails, you can get to us on the Fortuna site. Um, and we're, we're really looking forward to keeping in touch with you guys. So thank you. Great. Well, thanks. Uh, you, everyone stay. There's still hundreds of people. Thank you for the time um, from wherever you are in the world uh, and at home with, uh, with your families. We wish you well. Stay safe. Thanks very Bye, much. Bye, everybody. Be well. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.